to see all the faces who saw the very first sermon. And Bill Doolittle has reminded me of this about three different times since I got here, that the first one was three minutes long. Um, and he talked to Pastor about it and said that he'd vote for me to be able to come back and speak today as long as it was a three minute sermon. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to redeem all of that time that I didn't spend on that first sermon today. So I hope you guys are ready to be here for a while. Um, things have been uh, very interesting as we've gone through a pandemic. I'm sure you guys have all noticed uh, that this last year has not been a normal year for anyone. And uh, for our church uh, over in Jamestown, it's been the same. It's been different. But we've watched God do some incredible things. Uh, we've been going through a revitalization process. And what was really neat is uh, just three years ago when we started this process, we looked at uh, our church and, and how it was and how it was built. And we had one young family outside of Andrea and myself in the church. And this past week, we had 22 kids in the service, not including four regulars. And so we've seen a lot of growth through that, and God's done some incredible things. But Pastor didn't ask me to come here to just talk about that. He asked me to come in to be able to preach this morning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at John chapter 4 this morning. And uh, so if you go ahead and turn that. So we're, we're going through a series at Bethel right now that's called The Real Jesus. And what we're doing is going through the Gospel of John and we're looking at who Jesus actually was. We're trying to get away from stereotypes and thoughts of who he might have been and focusing on who he actually was. And so balance is a moment that is found as the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other. It's something that's very hard to achieve because we like to go from one extreme. We have spenders who can't hold on to a dime. And then we have savers who aren't willing to spend a dime. We have those who would binge an entire TV show, who binge TV shows over and over and over again. That's all they do. And then we have those who don't have a TV. The point is that very rarely do we do things in moderation. I could use a little bit more time in the gym, something that I've noticed uh, lately. However, when I go to the gym, I find out that the people that are there are generally obsessed with health. And so we have this idea of balance is something that is very, very hard to achieve. Because it's so easy to swing to these pendulums. And it's something that was very true in Jewish society at the time of Christ. And if we were honest, I think it's something that's also infected the modern church. That we go to extremes in one direction or the other. Jesus constantly challenged the culture that he was in. He taught them that traditions were not more important than people by allowing his disciples to eat without washing their hands. He healed people on the Sabbath, and when he was challenged, because that was supposed to be the day of rest, when he was attacked for this, he explained that the Sabbath was meant for man's benefit. Man was not created for the Sabbath. See, Jesus was a problem causer for the religious people of his day. He constantly challenged them on their beliefs and the things that they did. And so today we're going to look at a couple ways in which he ignored religious culture, or the religious culture of his day. And the result was many people coming to know him as Savior and changing their lives. So again, if you turn with me to John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. And therefore, when the Lord had known that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judah, or Judea, and departed to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So when he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob was there, or now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, 
Ask me, a Samaritan woman. For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and I would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him shall become a fountain <coughs> of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have said, Well, I have no husband. For you had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you have spoken truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you, Jews, say that Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this worship, or neither on this mountain nor Jerusalem worship the Father. For you worship what you do not know, and we worship, or, and we know what we worship. For the salvation of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word and to see the heart of Jesus. To see how he reached out to this woman. How he shared the truth with her and how she comes to know you and leads many others to you as well. We pray that you be with us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've been in church for any period of time, this is probably a familiar passage. It's probably one that you've heard once or twice. And so the question becomes, why this passage? The easy answer is I preached it last week, and Pastor and I decided just to, to <laughs> preach the same sermon we preached last week. <laughs> the other answer is, because I think there's so much that we can learn from this passage. Many times when I've worked on this passage, I focused in on the woman and who she was and what was going on in her life. But I want to look at this idea of the religious cultural standards of the day. Because Jesus really broke a lot of those standards when he reached out. And so what would those standards have been? Well, in order to talk about that, we're going to have to do some history. We're going to have to go back. And this is going to take a few minutes, but it really brings to light why these standards and rules were here. And so we're going to go all the way back to just after the flood and the Tower of Babel, when God calls a man to follow him named Abram. And God calls Abram and he says, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. You are going to have as many as descendants as there are stars in the sky. The land that your descendants will own will stretch from the great river of Egypt to the Euphrates. And your descendants will be a blessing to those who bless them and a curse to those who curse them. This is known as the Abrahamic Covenant. Because eventually Abram was renamed Abraham. And he spent most of his life traveling this land and he had two sons. One of them was with a slave woman because it appeared that his wife was not going to be able to bear a child. And it was an appropriate cultural thing to have a child with your wife's slave 
if she was unable to bear a child. And so they went this culturally appropriate step, which wasn't God's plan. God said, no, you're not going to have a child. This is not the child of the blessing that I'm going to give. You will have one with your wife, Sarah. And Isaac was born. Isaac, later on, had two sons, Ishmael and Jacob. And Jacob was chosen to be the heir of the promise. And he made some questionable decisions that led him to having 13 children with four different women because they were following religious cultural practices and being able to do things, which God used to eventually form the 13 tribes of Israel. Now, most people think of the 12 tribes of Israel because Jacob had 12 sons. But Joseph didn't have a tribe named after him. He had two sons that were given tribes. And so there's actually 13 tribes in Israel. Um, there are 12 tribes that got land because Levi was split out throughout all the land. And so there's some confusion there. But at the end of Jacob's life, the entire family moves down into Egypt. And there they spend 400 years in slavery. Originally they went down because the, the Pharaoh had blessed them, but a new Pharaoh arose and he put them into slavery. And for 400 years they cried out to God. A God who had promised them a huge land. Who had promised them many citizens. Who had promised them that they would be a blessing to those who blessed them and a curse to those who cursed them. And yet they were trapped as slaves in this land. And God heard their cries, and he called Moses forward, and God used Moses through 12 different plagues, or sorry, 10 plagues, to uh, free them from the nation of Egypt, and they headed to the land that God had promised them. A land that was now owned by the Canaanites. A group who was known for their cruelty, for their false worship, and the gods that they worshipped were Baal, Ashtoreth, Moloch, and others. Molech had a worship practice amongst the most evil that you could imagine, where they had bronze statues of Molech with his hands stretched out, and they would put their babies on the statue, and they'd let a fire underneath it, and they'd allow the babies to roll down his arms and into the fire. These were the people that were in the land. That was the kind of worship that was happening. And God warned the people that when they came into the land, they needed to drive the Canaanites out of the land, or else they would fall into the worship of these false gods. And he told them clearly, and he gave them direction. He said, I will be with you while you are in this land. But they failed to do it. At first, because they were afraid. They didn't trust that God was going to allow them to escape, or to take this land. And so for 40 years... They had to wander in the wilderness. Then they didn't seek God's counsel when a group of people came up and they were wearing old clothes and they had moldy bread and they said, we're from a faraway land, will you make a treaty with us? And they decided not to go to God and say, God, what's going on? And they found out that they were deceived, that these were actually just a group of people that were right around the corner. And then they grew weary of war and decided to settle down. And so for the next 400 years, they would intermarry with those in the land. And they would begin to worship these idols. And God said, enough is enough. And he would send in a nation to take over. And they would take over and the people would go, oh no, we have left God. And so they would repent and they would say, God, will you free us? And he would raise up a judge, a military ruler. And they would be saved and they would follow God for a time period. And then they would fall back into this trap. And over and over and over again, we go through the cycle. We follow God. We don't follow God. God sends judgment. We repent. God sends a judge. We follow God. And for 400 years, they continue this spiral over and over and over again. And eventually, they end up with a king. Unfortunately, most of the kings led them into the worship of idols. And I promise there's a point that we're getting to here. So finally, God raises up the Assyrians and the Babylonians to completely remove the Israelites from the land. 
and a new people has moved in. Only there were problems. Because God was not done with his people. And God sent lions in and they attacked the people. And the people that were there cried out to the king and they said, Please send somebody who knows the customs of this land and knows the God of this land so that we can learn from him. And so the king did. And they learned about God. However, they kept their own false worship as well. They just added Yahweh. They just added the God of the Jews to the religions that they had. And the group was formed known as the Samaritans. Part Jew, part Gentile. Following some of the teachings of God, but also following others as well. And so when the Jews escaped captivity and came back into the land, they decided they would never again fall for idols. They would never again worship anybody but God. They had learned their lesson. 400 years of following false gods and going through that pattern. Years and years of all these different kings being taken out of their land, taken into Babylon and Assyria. They said, enough is enough. We are not going to follow any more false gods. And two main religious groups came into being. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both committed to following every command of the law. Both hating those half-breed Samaritans that were just above them. And so they decided that in order to follow the law, they were going to follow every letter of that law, but they were going to go further than that. Because they were going to make sure that with these additional rules and regulations that they could not even come close to breaking one of God's commands. And so if God said, you shall not work on the Sabbath, they were going to define what it meant to work on the Sabbath. Down to how many steps you could take. Because if you took one extra step, then that was considered to be work. Matter of fact, if you were to go to Israel today and be in Jerusalem on Saturday, the elevator stops on every single floor because it would be work to push the button in the elevator. The additional rules were put in place. Now they were to make sure that they didn't fall for idols again because they knew the consequences for falling into the worship of idols. And in order to make sure that they didn't fall for the Samaritans, those evil half-breeds, they didn't even walk through the land of Samaria. See, if you were in Judea, which is up in the north, and you needed, or sorry, Galilee, and you needed to get to Judea, the closest way to do that is to go straight down. But instead of doing that, which would take them through Samaria, they would cross over the Jordan River, walk through Gentile lands, and then cross the Jordan River again and go into Galilee, or Judea. Because they didn't even want to interact with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were hated. Nothing good came out of Samaria. And that's why it's so interesting when we get back to this chapter 4. In verse 4 we read, But he needed to go through Samaria. Because Jesus did something that he wasn't supposed to do. Jesus went to Samaria. So with all that as background, I hope you understand that this is a big deal going through the land of Samaria. It was a huge cultural taboo. taboo. He wasn't supposed to do that. No self-respecting Jew would ever be caught in Samaria, and yet Jesus, God himself, brought not only himself into Samaria, but he brought his followers into this land. And he knew what the religious culture taught him. He knew the judgment that would be cast upon him. But he was more worried about the people that he was about to meet that needed love than he was worried about the overzealous religious rules of his day. And again, there was a good heart behind these rules. I'm not saying that trying to follow God's rules and God's word is bad. 
But they got to a point where they started following rules instead of following God. And they morphed it in a way, into a way of judgment and hatred instead of following God and love. And so when, God, or when Jesus stepped into the land of Samaria, it was a big deal. So Jesus went where he wasn't supposed to go. The Israelites had established this religious cultural rule to protect themselves because of their past failures. No one goes through Samaria. And yet, Jesus breaks right through, bringing his disciples with him and showing them that loving people is more important than the man-made religious cultural rules. But he wasn't done yet. Because not only does he go where he's not supposed to go, but he talks to somebody that he was never supposed to talk to. And that is a woman. Let's pick it up in verse 5. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and he said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. This interaction is huge. It's huge in the life of this woman. It's huge in the life, of, or at that time period in general. Because Jesus was sitting by this well, now this well is sitting about five miles outside of town. And his disciples have gone into town to try to get some food in. And Jesus is resting. It's about noontime. So it's the hottest time of the day. And then this well is approached by a woman. And Jewish men did not talk to women. Unless it was their wife or their daughter. And yet, when Jesus sees her, he says to her, Give me a drink. And in that moment, with that simple sentence, once again, Jesus is breaking his religious, or the religious cultural rules of his day. He was alone with a woman, five miles away from anybody else, and he was talking to her. Any Jew who saw this would have been very upset. <coughs> Matter of fact, I think that if we had seen this today, we'd be very upset because... Jesus was breaking what's known as the Billy Graham rule, which states that no man or woman can ever be alone in any circumstance. And while that rule is something that is good, because in general, guys and girls should not be alone together, sometimes the application gets off, and if you see somebody coming out together from a, a place, if you assume there is sin there, it's gone too far. And so Jesus is alone with this woman, and he's talking to her. But it's not just being alone with a woman, it's being alone with a Samaritan woman. Something that even she realized was wrong. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? See, she realizes that something is wrong. She asked Jesus how he could be talking to her, a Samaritan woman. Because remember all that history we talked about? All that hatred of the Samaritans? Well, that's not just something that somebody told her. That's something that she lived. She knew the hatred of the Jews for her. And so she was amazed to see a Jew sitting at the well in the first place. Let alone the fact that and so she brings it up. But she's not just a woman. She's not just a Samaritan. But she's an immoral Samaritan woman. See, there's a reason why she's at this well at noon. The well that's five miles outside of town instead of the well that's right in the center of town. And that's because she wanted to avoid all the women of the town. And that reason comes up later in her conversation with Jesus. If you come to verse 16, he says, Go, 
Call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one whom you have now is not your husband. And that you've spoken truly. So the truth comes out in their conversation. She doesn't have a husband. But she's had five different men that have married her. And the person that she's living with now is not her husband. The ladies in town most likely hated her. She's proven that she can't maintain a relationship. She's also proven it's not very hard for her to get into the next one. And that she's willing to live with a man that she's not married to. And so she goes out to the well, five miles outside of town, at the hottest time of the day, to avoid the people. And so right now we have a woman, a Samaritan woman, an immoral Samaritan woman. And we have Jesus, the sinless Son of God, alone with her, five miles from anyone else, choosing to talk to her, choosing to show her love and compassion. See, Jesus broke all the rules. Instead of being focused on her sin, which he does deal with. Instead of being focused on what people might think, Jesus saw a person in desperate need. He saw a woman made in the image of God who needed to be saved, and that's where his focus was. And as the story unfolds, we see Jesus' heart. He takes her from the current situation and shows her her need. Starting by saying, give me a drink, leads to, how can you ask me for a drink? And then he explains that he has living water, and she scoffs, you have nothing to draw from, because she's worried about the physical things. She's expecting Jesus to stick down uh, something into the well and to draw water out. And Jesus explains that it's not physical water that you need. Because if you drink physical water, you will thirst again. And she begins to create, he begins to create this thirst in her life, and he begins to deal with her sin by telling her to call her husband, and it reveals this immoral status that she has. And she learns that she has this need. And he calls her out for her past. But he doesn't withhold his offer for living water. He doesn't say, because you have an immoral past, it disqualifies you. God doesn't take eternal life away because of our sin or our past. Then she tries to get into a religious debate, and Jesus gets right down to the point. Instead of having this debate with her, we find in verse 26, after she mentions the Messiah, he says to her, I who speak with you am he. He declares that he is the Messiah. And at this point, we see evidence that this woman realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. And she believes. She believes in him and her sins are forgiven on the spot. Her life is reset. And then verse 27 happens. And at this point, his disciples came. And they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking to her? And the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the city to see him. <clears throat> see, the disciples walk out at this moment of salvation. In this moment where they miss it. See, they're so focused on their religious cultural standards. They're so focused asking each other, why is he talking to her? That they miss the woman who was weighed down by her sin. Who was avoiding people. Who was walking five miles outside of town on the hottest time of the day. So she didn't have to interact with anyone. Living with a man she wasn't married to. 
they missed the moment of salvation for her. They missed the joy. The weight of her sin disappearing. They missed the woman who had run back to those people that she was avoiding because she had to tell them about Jesus. They missed all of it. Because they were focused on the fact that Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman. So maybe you're here this morning and, and you'd identify more with the woman. You've lived a, a rough life. You've made some poor choices. You know what it's like to avoid people. You know what it's like to feel judged everywhere you go. Jesus has the same offer for you that he had for that woman. He didn't allow her to justify her sin. But he did forgive her. And Jesus is calling out to you right now. Please don't think you need to fix your life in order to come to Jesus. Because if you come to him, he says he'll forgive you, he'll love you, and he'll help you. Or maybe you identify more with the disciples. You know your religious culture. You see when somebody violates that religious cultural rule. You notice when they don't fit in. It might be a fellow believer. It might be a non-believer. But you've trained yourself to see the rules instead of the person. You might even be imagining up sin that's not there. Is it time for us to start focusing in on people's hearts? Is it time for us to focus in on the fact that people are made in the image of God? No matter what they look like or how they act. Sin needs to be dealt with. I'm not saying that, that we let sin go. But can we see through the tattoos? Can we see through the strangely colored hair? Can we see through the acting out and seeking attention to see a person who needs to be loved and find a way to reach them with the gospel? To focus on love rather than judgment. Maybe it's time that we need to live by grace rather than the law, especially if it's man-made religious culture. So the action step that we have for today is to determine what religious cultural standards we might need to reevaluate. Is there something in our lives that we would say, you know, this is something that I've believed is the right thing, but it's really not in line with God's heart. And I need to reevaluate that. Uh, Bethel, we use what we call a communication cards, and we don't have that here this morning, but I'm going to ask a couple of the questions uh, that were on that card. And these are just for you to think through. One religious cultural idea that I need to let go of is, is there something that, that God's put on your heart that you would say, you know, as I thought through this this morning, this is something that's, that's challenging me. Or would you say, I need to stop expecting others to live by my standards? Again, this isn't stop following God. God has his standards and his rules, and we need to follow those, but my standards. Do I need to be focused more on people's hearts than their exterior? And the last one is, do I need to be focusing more on loving people rather than judging them? What is it that God is asking you to think about this morning? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for our opportunity to look into your word and to see the heart of our Savior. To realize that we ourselves are deserving of judgment because of the sin that we have. And yet you chose to love us even though we didn't deserve it. I pray that we would be able to show forth that same love to others. That we would be good representations of who you are. And that we wouldn't let our religious culture get in the way. But we would seek to truly follow after you in your heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name.